Greetings, everyone. This is Rock and Roll Spot Connection. We're to come up with Roundup. And this is our last Roundup before Christmas, so it's kind of a light week. Um, not light enough that there's only one video, but it's fairly light. So, kicking things off, we've got Excalibur number 16. Where we left off... While the Captain Britain Corps had returned during Ten of Swords, not among their number was the Betsy Braddock of Captain Britain of Earth 616, leader of Excalibur. Also, Apocalypse, or A, who was also working with Excalibur, had opted to return to Araka with his family. In the aftermath of Ten of Swords. So we begin on Krakoa with uh, Remy having sir gotten some eggs for, uh, or made, kept, bleh, cooked some eggs for Rogue. Um, in fact, the eggs were imported by courtesy of the Marauder, as the plant that was making eggs was getting them all wrong. And, but Rogue's just kind of feeling not really, you know, just not great. You know. Sure, the Captain Britain Corps is back and they're all Betsy, but not their Betsy. So, meanwhile, uh,. Jubilee and Shogo were come across Richter, who's trying to get in touch with with Apocalypse, but uh, she's kind of you know he's gone. Um, at the Green Lagoon, uh, Blob is informed as to what's going on with uh, what's happened with Betsy as well, and. Uh, and opts to join Remy and Rogue in a bit of day drinking before, as Jubilee and Richter show up. Um, and Richter is apparently acting as though the team, basically, as though A was lost. But. Remy, you know, reminds him, no, 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 we didn't lose A. He left. You know, he, he has nowhere else to be. You know, Betsy got swindled by Saturnine. Deserves justice. But A chose to go. And so Richter asks, you know, why you start all, all this? We weren't going to finish it. And so they put in a, uh, an investigation of death, a wrongful death, request for uh, X Factor uh, which the results come back and it's really hard to see they, they can't come to a definitive okay yeah she's dead so we'll, the five will resurrect a new one uh, the report reads as follows missing person was officially reported to X Factor by Rogue though she was not present for the missing person's disappearance accounts of the disappearance were collected from those present and did not differ from one another the missing person entered a duel while wielding the recently acquired Starlight Sword. The sword appeared to shatter during an otherwise normal parry, and the missing person was said to shatter likewise. The pieces were then collected by Saturnine and, and are believed to rest in the Starlight Citadel in another world. Physical, psychic, and witness investigation provided no definitive evidence of death. Scans of various spectrums and energy waves were performed with no result. The crime scene location, not safely accessible, so no investigation was performed. We do not recommend resurrection protocols at this time due to the last known location of missing person and the inherent risk of complications in the resurrection process. Status results in conclusive no proof of death request escalation to experts. And who are the experts, you might wonder? Excalibur. So, X Factor gives Excalibur the report in person. Rogue kind of feel like they're being blown off, but. Procedure explains, no, that's not it. It's just, you know, this is a little bit different than what we would be used to, so. 
you know, trying to, you know, maybe a scholar needs to do some investigating. So the team, so they suit up, head over, and head out to Avalon. Um, and it turns out that Brian Braddock uh, has joined his brother Jamie there. He is, after all, Captain Avalon now. Along with him are also his wife Megan and their daughter. And so they have a, a you know bit of a reunion. Um, interesting point of fact is that uh, apparently. I don't know how old she's supposed to be, but it seems to me that uh, Brian and Megan's daughter is a bit more wiser than her years suggest. And probably about ten times more sure than her Uncle Jamie ever will be. So... Megan joins Excalibur, and they go in search of, uh... And basically going, going to find out what they can about, uh, everything. Um... However... Jamie says he's still going to try something, and yeah, he won't... And okay, he's not going to use his, uh, reality warping abilities. He's got other ideas. So he puts the cape that he, uh got off of Sinister back on and heads through, heads through the gate. Near the start of Citadel, um, Megan kind of bonds with the, the world. And it, it's kind of explained that uh, the other world's in her nature and she's connected to it, so it, you know, in a way it empowers her. So she's in her element, almost literally. And so, using the grimoire, uh, Richard's thinking maybe he's got uh, maybe he's got an idea or three. On Bar Sinister, um, Jamie's plan. This is Jamie basically says, "Hey, I'll give you. I'm calling you my favor. Clone me, clone me a copy of my sister. Uh, oh, and uh, here's your cape back." Uh, also, Sinister accuses Braddock of having a fake accent. So, Excalibur band together in, in an attempt to contact the fair, the Fae, and uh, maybe figure out, see if they know anything about what's going on. Uh, instead, uh, and while they do manage to, it does somewhat work, also some are the Captain Britain Corps. They explain what's happened, And so, they say, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll uh, you know, put out a call and search for her. Um, there's also a write-up on the, uh, the ritual that Excalibur performed from the Grimoire. Meanwhile, elsewhere in the multiverse, Bexy wakes up to uh, Warren bringing her tea. And apparently Betsy is the queen in this reality. And that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to our next... And so we move on to our next title of the week. Going from the X-Men to the Avengers with U.S. Agent number two. I guess now it's John Walker, U.S. agent, but yeah. Where we left off, um, U.S. agent was trying to recruit a would-be bomber and encountered a piece of the Rigani and Mori Watanabe. After a brief fight between the two, uh, Walker received a decoded order from his handler. Mori tagged along um, as the agent was sent to a uh, Virago, Vira, uh, Virago distribution hub. Distribution hub. It was explained the issue. Virago is a uh, 
one, it was basically one of the uh, shell companies that would that would be used for uh, shield, for secret shield facilities. Um, a group of guards at the facility attacked uh, Agent and, and Mori, and one of them revealed themselves to be none other than U.S. Agent's younger sister, Katie. So first, we get a uh, we get a few people talking about the uh, destruction of the uh, power plant that, that was that powered the the distribution hub. Uh, we also get. Um, a lecture from part of a lecture from Harvard for, from four days previously. After the uh, afterwards, the uh, person presenting the uh, presented the talk gets in a cab. And injects himself with a glowing blue uh, formula. It seems to cause him to swell up, swell up a bit. One goes for to say Hulk out, but um, the same day in Omaha, Nebraska, at the Haruska Federal Courthouse, Val Cooper comes upon the two uh, agents who sent uh, U.S. agent in, in to uh, investigate the Virago hub. We didn't get a flashback of um, one of the earliest memories of, that uh, U.S. agent John Walker has, and that's fire in his childhood home, wallpaper in uh, him and his sister's room melting, and suddenly his sister rushing into the room to grab her doll and turning her right back around and ignoring him. Apparently, though, John's brother Mike pulled him out. And so, now, Walker is trying to fix his uh, various vehicles. His origins have gone over a wee bit, uh, and he's arguing with his sister. He's also mad that uh, his sister and, his, and her men kind of messed up his shield a bit. Um, elsewhere, Maury is uh, being accosted by some of the youngins, and who, one of whom is uh, pointing, holding Maury's gun on him. Though, it's been basically it was cleaned, cleaned and field stripped, and empty. So, you guys, his sister. While they argue, he does find out about a, a bit about what's going on and what what's up with their team, and so he does need to get something, try and track something down from from within the town. Um, he gets mistaken for being Captain America because, well, yeah. I mean, his costume is kind of similar. That's kind of the entire point. And, you know, hey, circular shield, you know. Um, but he asks, and Dan returns to tell his sister that uh, apparently, yeah. Townsfolk don't don't have the thing. Um, but uh, Agent Sister also you know kind of lays some uncomfortable truths on him. Namely that the fire that he remembers, uh, childhood memory, yeah, that was, that was caused by his brother. Oh, it was an accident. Spurred on by him having passed out mid beer, and yeah. 
pouring the beer on an electric heater. And that uh, their brother didn't die in a, in a chopper crash. He, um, he, he, he found his own, he took his own way out. She has that, uh, you know, he wasn't well. His sister's men attack him. He, yeah, he does kind of throw, knock them all off of him. And he does, he mentions, yeah, he, you know, he did forget his sister, but it's not going to happen again. Comes aboard his uh, vehicle, flies off, and the troops, the agents with him, there's a good riddance before someone shows up and basically slits all their throats. Someone who grabs Katie by the throat and then kisses her. She tells him he's late and calls him U.S. agent. But it's not her brother. And that is where the issue ends. Which brings us to our next book for the week. King in Black, number two. Where we left off... Null made Earth had made planet fall. Um, he killed the Sentry, much the same way the Sentry killed Carnage all those years ago. He removed the Venom symbiote from Eddie Brock and tossed him off the Empire State Building, and basically and wrapped the world in darkness. So the issue begins with Eddie landing on a car from kind of sort of from the end of uh, the last issue of Venom. Spidey finds him. And realizes he, he's messed up. Null sees this and just uh, and asks how hard is it to kill one man? And it turns out that uh, the heroes that were standing against Null, they've all been nullified, I guess. I mean, they're, they were much the same way as in Absolute Carnage. Carnage was making kind of drone symbiotes with his, with his uh, symbiote and putting them on others to basically be, you know, cheap mint cannon fodder. That's kind of what Null's doing with the other heroes. Only, instead of doing it to regular people, he's doing it to, you know, superheroes like Cyclops, Captain America, The Thing, Storm, and Miss Marvel. So, Spidey makes a, makes a break for it. Um, Human Torch shows up, basically buying Spidey time to get him and Eddie out of there. And he says he's going to do a Nova Blast and says, hey, you know, Tell everyone I said something cool before before this happened, all right? I got a reputation to uphold. Um, but Spidey takes Eddie to the home base of the FF. He and Valkyrie talk, and Valkyrie explains that, well, yes, and her, you know, so she's Dr. Jane Foster. As Valkyrie, she knows when someone's close to death. And she, she explains that while she can't tell Peter how they can fix Eddie, they can tell him they need to hurry. But now she has to go recover the sentry's soul. Meanwhile, Spidey goes to check on Dylan and explain that, yeah, things aren't looking good with Eddie. Meanwhile, um, we've got Invisible Woman, Mr. Fantastic, Black Panther, Blade, and Valkyrie with holograms of uh, Magneto and Xavier arguing with Blade. And 
Uh, Blaze trying to get the get Xavier and I mean, Maggie to send more mutants to New York, but Xavier kind of like, you know, uh, we've already lost too many people, too many of our, of our own. You know, we can help formulate a plan together. Um, Blade suggests that they open the gates. Magneto is like, uh, no. And Peter asks if there's any news on Eddie. Patrice says there's no change, but they're working on it. So the roads are attack, and if they can't get the spread under control, they don't be able to... Um, but Panda does say they, they, they will have the full mind of Wakanda at their back. And so then they start asking about, you know, okay, but then Panda makes a really good ask. You know, what about all those insanely powerful things that we have, just, we usually just laying around? You know, the Infinity Stones, the Cosmic Cube, the Ultimate Nullifier. Do we have anything on hand that can take them out? But uh, Blade's kind of like, um, are we really discussing bringing that kind of firepower on the board? I mean, this is just one dude. Though uh, Valkyrie explains that, uh, you know, he was the first being born in the Void. He's killed Celestials, he killed the Sentry, and now he's taken almost all the Avengers and drowned the world in darkness. So, you know, maybe they should keep, take the King, King of the Abyss seriously. And then Namor shows up. Explaining that, you know, and he has that his people have been fighting in the freezing dark for millions of years. And, well, you know, hey, the, the Avengers, FF, so forth, they just started. And they are losing. The majority of the planet belongs to him, so if Null wants a war, well, then he's got one. The Atlanteans will fight. And then he asks if any of the adults in the room have anything to offer in the way of a plan. Tony does. Explaining that they need Eddie Brock alive. He's the only one that can break into the hive and get close enough to Null to shut him down. The only thing that can save him now is a symbiote. So, Tony gonna get go grab go get him one. Plus he's got a few plus he's got a few other ideas. Namor resurrect uh, calling upon the Black Tide. Uh, Blade recruiting the help of uh, the vampires. And then finally, having someone get in touch with uh, New York City's duly elected mayor, Wilson Fisk. He shows up at the bar with no name and asks who wants to make some money. So, covering Iron Man's plan, he goes after the... He uses Extremis on one of the dragons. And he kind of gets... He ends up getting connected to the hive mind, and... He shows up. Barely. They try to bond the, symb the symbiote to uh, Eddie, but it's making him worse. Dylan obliterates the symbiote, showing off to everyone he's got abilities. However, as he did so, Eddie Brock died. And that is where the issue ends. Yeah, okay, pretty good. Brings us to this week's other King, King and Black related edition title, Spider Woman number seven. Where we left off, Spider Woman was trying to find a cure for uh, what's wrong with her, and she was kind of taking a quasi cure, which is actually kind of worse than what than what actually is wrong with her, and potentially also her son, and definitely her niece. The serum she's been taking is also making her careless and reckless. Um, but yeah, she went to go contact someone and 
Well, yeah. Venom stuff. So, her, Captain Marvel, Hawkeye, Luke Cage, and Iron Fist are all gathered in front of Night Nurse's clinic, hoping, to, you know, trying to, you know, help people. Um, they go after. Hawkeye's arrows aren't doing anything. Um, Venom Blast can be doing a bit of a trick, but Carol's kind of been, it's explained that Carol's kind of been benched a little. That's kind of a hey, don't you know, don't exhaust yourself. We're probably gonna need you later. But Jess kill, does manage to take down one of those dragons. Um, and I mean, even after it slams into the ground, she just keeps on pounding on it until every, basically Carol pulls her off. But everyone ends up fighting her. Um, eventually they're able to uh, knock her out for a moment and it turns out that uh, Night Nurse has a uh, halt cell in her clinic which they put Jessica in. It should also be noted that during the fight with the dragon, Jessica basically took what she had left of the, uh, the serum. So, yeah, she's... Basically, she's going through a hardcore o overdose and withdrawals. And basically, everyone... You know, look... It's like, okay, you've, you had, you know, basics kind of a, this is the point where you had to deal with this. And everyone leaves. However, somehow now, oh, what was her, what? An old enemy of hers. Oh yes, and Octavia Vermis shows up, offering to assist Jessica and explaining that they have much more in common than uh, Jessica might think, which is where the issue ends. I'm not sure. I'm not sure this is the uh, only King and Black tie-in issue or not, but yeah. Moving on, however, to Marvel number three. So. Kind of the important thing is the framing story, which is Nightmare has Doctor Strange held prisoner and is in the astrally and is making him watch as he devours the world. Basically, Nightmare is getting, getting more power in the framing story. Uh, our next story focuses on Namor. Um... Meeting with an intelligence contact uh, on a shore, um, and she, you know, passes along some intelligence. Look at name more fighting off a bunch of uh, underwater. Oh. Fascist based underwater. And they try to trick him, but he's able to, they try to pull one over on him, but he does anymore does manage to, you know, show show the bad guys. Then he saves the day. It turns out that he's been telling this whole the story to Cap.
And this is apparently after uh, Cap's return to uh, the real world, as afterwards, Namor states that he should have that he should have left Cap in that big ice cube. We then get a story called Beginnings, which largely focuses on uh, kind of starts off with Owato almost doing a uh, The Watcher, doing something with a comedy bit. Um, about creation. An artist creating, and he, young young boy, start, you know, starts with something simple, a line, drawing a line. Later, that something simple becomes you know, some more, draw some stuff with it, you know, some like Wiley Coyote type stuff, and then draw the superhero, the Blue Bolter, then drawing, you know, copying stuff from comics, Ditko Spidey. Kirby's Thor. Yeah, um, we get some shot, a shot of Neil Adams' uh, Havoc from back in uh, X Men number 57, the cover of the issue at least. And yeah, it's, uh, it's the Watcher just talking about creation. And then a safe lands on, falls on his head in the middle of space. And then we've got uh, quick interlude with uh, Rocket Raccoon having found a planet full of uh, raccoon-ish creatures that uh, all seem rather smitten with him. And then finally we have the Black Widow, the Golden Age Black Widow, not Natasha Romanoff, waiting for a, trying to find herself a husband. And she thinks she's found the perfect man, Red Skull. And she drags the Red Skull to hell to be her, to be her husband. As they head, and then she takes them on to their uh, eternal honeymoon in hell. After they're married by, suppose, Mep a, a much different looking version of Mephisto, we'll just simply say. Back in the framing story, however, Nightmare has uh, decided that uh, Str Doctor Strange's Earth was a fine for his course, but now it's time for something more substantial. Is about to face off with the Celestials, Galactus, and Ego, the Living Planet, at, at the very least. Which leaves Strange wondering if Nightmare is only keeping Strange alive to witness his battles against the cosmic entities. What will become of Strange if Nightmare wins? What will become of us all? And that is where the issue ends. Brings us to our last Marvel book of the week, Maestro, number five. Where we left off, the Maestro, the Hulk, oh, the Hulk, had engineered the death of the Maestro, Hercules, uh, utilizing the uh, long-standing member of the UFOs, Vapor, who turned into a, uh, took up Vapor's form and killed the Prince of Power. So... The basic idea became, okay, well, long, you know, the king is dead, long live the king. So, we have Hercules' funeral procession led by the Hulk. You know, burying his friend. The people watching, and Hulk basically says, hey, I'm taking charge. 
I'm, take, I'm going to take the maestro's place. And one of the citizens asks, you know, why should you be in charge? Why don't we have an election? Vote. And, well, yeah, that does not end well at all. The dogs of war come back in. and However, some of uh, Rick Jones's people go after, uh, are there. Destroy one of the dogs of war. Fight breaks out. But Hulk kind of levels the playing field a bit by, well, punching the ground. Because, you know, Hulk. However, while... While all that was going on, Hercules' burning body, it lit a fire on a funeral pyre, after all, comes to, and it's explained that uh, Hades is, is doing Hercules a favor, allowing him to wreak vengeance on, on Hulk. So, Hulk fights the undead, burning undead Hercules, um, and... Hercules' old uh, Major Domo blasts him with Forge's anti-Hulk gun, destroying Hercules' body. Hulk then goes to Rick Jones' uh, private or underground base, but it's, it's evacuated. There's a video message waiting for Bruce. And Rick Jones basically said, you know, hey, you're basically turning into your father, and I'm not going to have that. I'm not, I'm not going to be around. I, I will not let, you, let, this ha let that happen. He says goodbye, and then the base is destroyed. The base blows up, has a self-destruct mechanism, which doesn't really affect the Hulk much, but he pulls himself out. And so the Major Dome asks if Bant asks if Hulk wants to return to the castle, you know, first calling him Banner, then asking if he prefers Hulk, and then says that, uh, he thinks maybe he's going to call him both names, and says to call him Maestro. That is where the issue ends. And this is the, the, the end of the first Maestro miniseries. There will be a follow-up series starting next month. Um, let's see what it's called. War and Pax. So, yeah. And that's all for now. As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Links to my Facebook, Twitter, Patreon, and PayPal can be found in the description box down below. This is Rock and Roll Spock signing off saying, Live long, rock hard, and Merry Christmas, everyone.